Fox at uh, Texas, and then he was a senior national fellow at uh, Vancouver, um, UBC. And uh, then he went to his current uh, institution, the Louisiana State, where he's been uh, building a huge group uh, working on numerical relativity. And we'll tell you about that. He's been moving into incorporating, besides the general relativity solutions, for example, merging black holes, putting in uh, the physics you need in terms of objects that actually have sort of bearing on them. And uh, so, well, Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. And it's always fun to be in Canada. I really spent two wonderful years in, at the RN. That was a lot of work. Um, OK, so let me explain first my title. Uh, this is numerical relativity. And what I think numerical relativity will be uh, finding much of its work in the future, which is trying to connect which things that you can see that being the electromagnetic spectrum with things that you don't see, uh, you shouldn't be able to see that's gravitational waves. Um, of course, and in, for this audience, I don't have to say a lot about the fact that we, we do have a lot of electromagnetic signals uh, signaling lots of very uh, fascinating phenomena out there. And the smaller brother or the smaller sibling in this game is still gravity waves that are are yet to be observed, but hopefully that's not taking that's not going to take too long now. Uh, these detectors, LIGO, um, are red in the so This is a picture. It's 20 miles from my from my place in Louisiana. There's another one in, in Washington. Uh, they are taking data at design sensitivities, uh, so that's uh, it's pretty amazing. If you look at the theoretical curve that was drawn 12, 15 years ago when the proposal went out, and what they have today, they're basically one on top of each other with the extra noise of real experiments and not theory, but uh, the experiment that got put it off and things are going to get better in the future. So there's a real opportunity to catch gravity waves. And once we're happy with that, uh, there's going to be a lot of physics uh, that we can uh, get out of them. And that's some of the things I'm going to take, uh, talk about. The systems that will produce gravitational waves that are catchable by these systems are those that have this that have in, in them the strongest dynamical possible and the highest velocities associated to them. Uh, those are the only ones that would produce strong enough gravitational waves that uh, we'll be able to catch. And so that requires simulations because Einstein's theory had to be uh, exploited in full. There is nothing a priori, though I'm going to kind of counter, uh, up, uh, counter up on this on this claim later on. A priori, you have to solve the full Einstein's equations and try to get all the physics out of them. Because there is no, in principle, approximation that you can uh, pull off to try to get insights in this in this system. So that's how numerical relativity essentially was born: trying to put everything together in a computer as hard as you could and, and get answers out of uh, different systems. So I talk about two different things. Because most of the activity so far has been in the binary black hole front, and let you I'll tell you a little bit of what the standard is nowadays. And uh, perhaps uh, that there will be a way around simulations uh, to get the broad aspects of the systems. And this will connect with some work that actually has been done here in CETA and was actually incited by a workshop that took place here. But then I move on to what happens beyond binary black holes. When you are just dealing with binary black holes, this is in vacuum. There is only one dissipated mechanism in the system, that being gravitational waves. There is nothing else taking place. But when you turn the know and, and include non-vacuum scenarios, then there is a lot of things, lower effects that will compete, and then hopefully I'll show you some examples of that. So the driver questions are as far as the binary black hole problem is concerned is two. Just what's the shape and form of gravitational waves for different configurations that being masses and spins? We know black holes are described by just two parameters, uh, their mass and their spin, essentially we don't believe their charge. So just Tell me what the mass and spin of a black hole, you uniquely, uniquely characterize each black hole. So we want to know what is the waveform that the system of some masses and spins come out so that then you can go to the uh, data, compare the theoretical expectation with um, the, the uh, data itself, and hopefully tell what the system that produces that waveform is what's all about. And as a side remark, we are also interested to see if there is any surprise at the theory level. I mean, GR, we believe in GR, but there might be surprises. GR might not be the ultimate theory. There might be some, some things that will not exactly match the theoretical expectations, which will then turn onto the theories to try to explain what's actually going on. 
And this space is intentionally left blank because we are going to come back to these questions again because this is essentially all there is to, as far as fiber questions, for the binary black hole uh, system. So for a long time, we were trying to simulate this black hole. So it took about uh, 20 years from the very first simulations to a simulation first done by Franz Pretorius so two years ago uh, to actually do solve the fault problem starting from these two black holes separated uh, some large enough distance, bring them through the in spiral, the merger, and the final single black hole. We always knew you could distinguish in this system three distinct stages. Early on, when they are sufficiently separated, you believe that Newtonian theory with some small corrections called post-Newtonian uh, uh, effects can account for the dynamics of the system. At very late times, you know there's a contractor solution, that being the Kerr black hole solution, that when perturbed rings down as a perturbed bell back to a, one of these stationary solutions, and we knew for a long time very well these two stages. Uh, the question was what happens in the middle, and for that uh, was what numerical simulation was supposed to do. And after the fact, after these simulations uh, brought the results, what we find is there is actually no surprise. There's nothing quite interesting in that. The waveform looks very much like what you would have done very naively to try to bring what you knew here into what you knew here. I'll, I'll show you an example in just a second. So there is a very smooth transition from the first stage to the last stage um, without nothing major going on. So what the field is trying to do nowadays is just to try to make predictions. A simulation, every single simulation can cover a single, uh, a single particular case, but you have a continuum of parameters, the mass of the black holes, the mass of the spins, and then try to do everything together. So now with the insights brought from the simulations, we're trying to map out what's going on, doing some simulations and mostly trying to come up with some efficient or effective description of the problem that will try to tell you perhaps where you might find some interesting behavior. <coughs> So the business now try to make a prediction, and despite what Yogi Berra said, uh, that you cannot predict the future, uh, since they don't care at all about baseball, but they do care about hockey. I got into hockey in Pittsburgh thanks to the Penguins, um, but I don't get baseball at all. But this, the scenario is if there is some simple and smooth behavior, maybe there is something very simple underlying the physics of the system that actually will tell you what's going, what's going on. So I'll, I'll get into this right now. So, we know that simulations show, show a rather simple behavior. The questions would be if this simple behavior is generic, where you might have some surprise, as you say. And the question is, can you map out what to expect for all possible configurations? Because then that it will impact some of the knowledge. And I'll show you one example as I move along. So the proposed games nowadays run and run. So if you have as many computers as you would like, then you just spawn many different simulations, and then you wait for a while that while might be two weeks to about a couple of months, and you analyze the data at the end of the day. More interesting is, well, given the simulations you have, try to come up with effective ways of describing the system. So there are some feed formula that have uh, been done by these people, some smarter feet, which actually came up out uh, of CETA by Ball, Michael Ball, the late and Pearson, in fact, they are later Ball, in my case, by my somebody in society, and some semi-analytical fits. That's the name this guy uses. I just, I just think it's an artifact. Uh, borrowing some, some of the tricks or some of the knowledge brought by uh, what these guys did. But the question is, is there anything else? A fit tells you why to predict numbers. Uh, gives you, some, with some given input, you can just look for another point in the primary space and try to get answers out of it. But the question that actually was uh, brought up by the workshop that took place in August last year is where there is something else. It's actually actually telling you about what the physics is uh, behind the system is. So again, I'm going to try to play a game here with you where I'm going to try to say, given this waveform, for instance, that you just see, so the post behavior ends more or less here, the quasi normal behavior starts more or less there, and basically you just proceed to uh, using the previous knowledge as use the simplest possible extrapolation from here into here, you would have drawn a curve that very much looked like this. That's why I said there isn't much 
as far as interesting new stuff going on. We're going to play a game. We're going to say, let's start with two binary black holes with some given masses. And my goal will be to try to predict what the final mass of the black hole will be and what the final spin would be. And that will have impact in uh, a bunch of different fronts, as I'll show you as we move along. And my main goal, again, is going to be to do the very simplest approximation. So I'm going to just put the old joke. I'm going to start with two spherical cows and try to uh, come up with well, the product that would be another spherical cow coming from the very simple or the simplest possible description. So let me just establish the rules of the game, and then there's going to be a unique answer to that. You have these two black holes with arbitrary mass and arbitrary spins. For these presentations, I'm going to assume that they have spins that are aligned with the orbital angular momentum, but it's just a, a, an artifact, I and mean, it's just a simplification. We can do it in general. As these black holes are very, very far apart, or just two particles with any mass, it doesn't matter, the angular momentum, the total angular momentum of the system, grows with square root of the distance. So it has, for long term purposes, infinite angular momentum. Gravitational radiation <coughs> makes the system lose very gradually that angular momentum. It's getting the orbit shrinks, they get closer and closer. At some point, the system has no other alternative but just to form a single black hole. And what I'm going to try to do is write a, a balance law that says the final total angular momentum that a single black hole stationary sitting there would have, which is a product, which is just a product of its mass as, and its angular momentum, which is a parameter, will be the addition of the individual angular momentum brought by each individual black hole that is spinning with some angular momentum parameter A1 and A2, plus some contribution of the orbital part of the, uh, the orbital motion. And here I'm just going to use, the only piece where I'm going to be using GR is here. This, if you want, is just Newtonian. If I tell you that a single particle that is spinning with a given uh, angular, with, uh, angular velocity, you will say its angular momentum is A times that angular velocity. So these pieces are just Newtonian. I'm just going to add here a little bit of GR by saying I'm going to estimate this thing by being the orbital angular momentum that a particle of reduced mass mu, just as you do in the two-body problem in Newtonian theory, is orbiting around a single black hole that has mass m and angular momentum parameter a, so of the final black hole. Of course, I haven't told you how to calculate this a, but everything else, if I'm assuming that this mass is just the sum of these two, so here I'm making an error because some mass will be radiated, but we know from numerical simulations that this is not much, so more than most 10%. I'm going to just use this formula very naively to try to obtain this final spin, which is the only uh, unknown. This is something that Blanford and Hughes did in the context of extreme mass, extreme mass ratio, my ratio to estimate the final spin to try to give the history, the possible history formation of supermassive black hole. They didn't know how to estimate this term, and therefore they just used the angular momentum parameter of the more massive black hole and the mass of the more massive black hole, and they wrote a very similar law, but actually, we're starting from that, but applying it to all possible mass ratios uh, by using this, this formula, which is, you can just uh, get out of a simple paper written by Barin and Press in the uh, 70s or 80s. So this is some of the numbers you get out. Um, let me just point to this plot, which it doesn't matter what it is. The, answer, the, the main point I'm trying to make here is, here are predictions or actual data obtained from numerical simulations with what this prescription tells you about. For a case where you start with um, no initial spin in black holes, so these are black holes that just have no spins, and you make them go orbit around each other, form a single black hole, and get the final uh, spin of the black hole. And this is, on top of it, is our prediction. So again, there is some differences, but for all intent purposes, it's getting uh, the job done. This is, again, our prediction in black with some numerical data. There isn't much here, and it, it turns a little bit here just due to numerical errors. But again, the main, the main uh, message is these two lines are pretty much the same. This green line I'm going to get to back as I move along. This is some effective one-body way of doing this thing. This is something championed by Thibault Amor and Alessandro Bonanno, which after the numerical simulation started to come out, they fix it because otherwise this, this curve actually came down this way and they actually predicted there was a maximum spin and this kind of weird behavior turning around, which was completely wrong. I mean, 
numerical simulation shows that that wasn't the case. So then they fix it and they are able to make this turn around. But it's, it is I mean, not doing a good job here. Uh, several refined incarnations of this are actually uh, have taken care of that and brought it more towards the numerical simulations. One example of this formula where you can use it to is perhaps make contact with supermassive black holes. This is starting from, let me look at this line, which actually is contained here. What you say is, suppose you have this maximum black hole, the individual black hole, spinning at its maximum possible value, which is one, and you ask the question, what's going to be the final spin that the black hole that forms after the collision of these two will have? And you get this formula that says, if you merge two black holes with the maximum spin by equal masses, uh, your final spin is below, is lower than the maximum value, which is one. So merging two black holes of the maximum spin give you a third black hole that has lower spin. So mergers will tend to drive down this, the final spin of the black hole. And this is just an exercise which we do the same for different values of the spin that you start with. So this is for the maximum and this is for zero. So as you start with non-spin initial black holes, your final spin grows and it keeps growing to some value and from there on it actually comes down. So what is the message of this plot is that as you merge black holes, there is some sweet value at about 0.95 above which if you keep merging, your final spin gets lower, below which if you merge, your final spin gets up. So it's kind of guesstimated that there is a maximum value for producing a supermassive black hole to mergers that you can achieve. The answer, so the, the upshot of that is if you are to go the, out there and measure a final spin of 0.999, then this model and, and similar ones would almost guarantee that that black hole didn't grow as merger, but in some other process. And again, as I said before, this, all these formulas, the fits, the semi-analytical fits, or the symmetry-based fits, they all more or less predict the same thing. So you could have done exactly the same calculation with the formula that the, the, it was uh, yeah, it came up from, from Zeta. But uh, there is a point that I want to make. Uh, this is another example that for general cases, again, our predictions and the numerical values are about the same, but this is not where I'm going to. What, what I'm going to is the following. Remember what I put in here. I put something that essentially was Newtonian with a little bit of GR that was just a particle on a fixed background to predict what the final answer was going to be. So I'm going to try to keep pushing that forward and see where that takes me. Remember, something we said is that in order to do the full description, we're using post-Newtonian numerical relativity and quasi-normal models. But in the formula I just wrote, I never use anything from kind of numerical relativity. I just use this effective description of a particle on a black hole background. So there is a possibility of just doing away with numerical relativity altogether and putting in here just radiation reaction. But let me don't go nuts because that's where I work and people are going to shoot me. So before I'm doing that, there's something else you can do. Something that is being done today in data analysis is they look at with the theoretical expectation from post-Newtonian post uh, waveforms, they have a cutoff frequency. They say, well, if you are going to start with these two masses, you are going to believe post-Newtonian theory at till some frequency, and there is where you do your theoretical template uh, matched against the numerical the data analysis signal, the data signal and then try to calculate it much. But that frequency at which you cut in current efforts is given by the Schwarzschild frequency of these two masses. So given those two masses, you assume the final black hole will have the addition of the two. That determines uniquely the Schwarzschild frequency. And you say, that's as, more, as, as much as I'm going to trust my post-Newtonian techniques. But our little models seem to indicate that you can actually push it a lot further. And that's completely consistent with what numerical simulations have shown. When they compare the numerical relativity answers with the post-Newtonian answer, they seem to read a lot more than the uh, structure frequency would tell you. So you can use this little model, and again, you could use any of these fits, uh, to just say, well, given some combination of masses, your final frequency at which you're going to trust or stop believing your post-Newtonian 
it's going to be that of the innermost zero circular orbit of the final black hole that has the mass being the addition of the masses and the final spin being predicted by any of these models. And again, I'm justified to use this because this simple model works, and these simple models didn't use any, any fit to a numerical data. It was just using pair of physics, a simple uh, first or, um, uh, back of the envelope uh, first principles, if you want. So this is what these guys did. This is one student still in Maryland. Uh, this was still in data analysis from LSU, one working with me, and this is a postdoc also in LSU. Um, they just explore these possibilities. And I'm just going to show you two pieces of evidence that may say, well, this may be a reasonable idea. Something that we know is that a, simple, a single black hole that is perturbed rings down with a very precise determined frequency. That frequency is the same thing as the light ring of that uh, black hole. So given a black hole, if you remember your GR, or if you don't, let me just say this, make this comment. Given a black hole, we distinguish two particular radii, and as I said to them, there are two particular frequencies. What is called the innermost stable circular orbit. That's a radius from the black hole, at which point, if you start a particle, in a geodesic, a circular geodesic, it's not going to be able to maintain that geodesic if you perturb it a little bit. If you're further away, you perturb it a little bit, and it will just stay in that geodesic. You go inside the ISCO, you touch it, and it will just fall into the black hole in vertical. That's for a particle, and it's called the ISCO. If you start, if you think of a photon now, that's called the light ring, and it's, just, it's the same thing. It's an R radius closer to the black hole, at which point, if you start a photon going in a circular uh, trajectory, if you perturb it, it will just fall in. So we know that gravitational waves of this black hole that is perturbed decay with a particular frequency given by the light ring. And the intuitive picture is that anything, if a photon cannot escape, nothing can escape. And the, that frequency is the limiting frequency that then does just matches any perturbation has to fall in the black hole, and eventually everything is going to ride it down to a stationary black hole. So what this guy did is the following uh, exercise. Something that is useful whenever you're doing any data analysis of, within, of any particular uh, process that you care about is to compute this thing called the time frequency volume that it says if this process is going to switch from one frequency into another one within some given amount of time, the product of the two tell you more or less the weight, how much, how important that little process is. If that process whatever, however important it might seem, happens to be a product of delta t times delta f essentially zero, you're not gonna see it in your data analysis. It plays no weight in your, in your effort. So what it is is compute this using three different measures. One, you know this difference in frequency that is given by the frequency associated to the light ring minus the frequency associated to the ISCO. And yet they compute the delta time using three different uh, ways. One is the Newtonian free fall time from the ISCO to the light ring. Another one is how much a particle will take driven by quadruple radiation to go from the ISCO, from the light ring, no sorry, from the ISCO to the light ring. And the third one is just integrated geodesical in curve, starting from the ISCO and crossing the light ring. So these are three different ways of doing the calculation. And only this third one matches very well with the numerical results. So these boxes are the numerical results and this one is the one you get here. Something else you can do is to say, well, let me go back to the point number one where I actually try to do away with numerical relativity and replaceable radiation reaction. We don't have a code to the radiation reaction trajectory of a particle starting from the ISCO and ending up in the light ring, but I'm just going to calculate the geodesic, the same one that these guys use to calculate this time. And using the quadruple formula, I'm going to get the waveforms out from a particle that starts at the ISCO and ends up in the light ring. And compare it with what happens before that, which is where I say use post Newtonian. So this is a post Newtonian up to the ISCO, which ends up here. And this is what this simple particle with, with mass, reduced mass mu, orbiting in this final black hole where you can break the mass of the spin um, and obtaining the wave from the quadruple formula looks like. So aside from this little gap here, they look very much the same. So if I actually put the numerical relativity simulations in front of it, and I make this, these lines a bit thick, about three or five or four percent thick, 
then you wouldn't distinguish one from the other. And this 3, 4% is important because LIGO has that error built in. So LIGO will not be able to distinguish this waveform from the numerical one just because of its inherent error. Things will change in the future, but that's the situation nowadays. What mass ratio is that done at? This is the equal mass ratio, but we've, I've done it to the, even the 1 to 6 and the same thing uh, plus. So it's just, I mean, it is something that it's not supposed to be a very sharp measure of what's going on, but it's a kind of a posterior explanation of why we see this very simple behavior. We see essentially a post behavior all the way to the east. The, these objects are going kind of quasi adiabatically around each other. The velocities involved are not too high. post is able to capture this, the dynamics very well. But after the ISCO, gravitational waves play a very minor role. What we know is happening is just essentially the so quote unquote potential. It's just dominating the whole behavior. I know if I start a particle from the light ring, from the ISCO to the light ring, it takes about 2.5 orbits to fall in. And that's as many orbits we see. Uh, before the black holes merge. So if it's non-circular though, you know? Right, so if it's not circular, this calculation wouldn't work. You have to account for the orbital contribution of a, an elliptic trajectory. And people have done this. So after our work, people in Vienna actually did that. And again, it matches very, very well. You wouldn't expect this to happen in nature though, because gravitational radiation circularizes the orbit, unless there is some extra agent that kicks one a little bit. But again, a, a very simple, um, basically potential kind of first order behavior just tells you what's going on for the most part. So if you if you go along with me, then well, it probably should be uh, filing an application with Walmart uh, because I will be out of a job. But then I'm trying to see how I'm going to save my career. So first, I'm going to have to say, I kind of was a bit provocative. And what I, what I presented before was a way to first say, kind of explain what is the main processes governing the dynamic. Second, it's a direct attack. Oh, should you're taking this? Well, it's a subtle um, <laughs> trying to make contact with what Damour is doing. So Damour has this effective one body approach that tries to describe everything with respect to a particle and uh, a particle undergoing a dynamics over a single black hole that is non-spinning. And he has, to add, he has to add, or they have to add a few correcting terms to actually match what is being seen. And what I'm saying here is, if you actually use it with respect to a final black hole that is spinning, because you know the final black hole is going to be spinning, say, in the equal mass case, then you should be using that. And these correcting terms might be a lot smaller. So my joke is, I can certainly describe a zebra as a perturbed Dalmatian, but I might have a better chance if I do it, if I try to use a horse. Um, uh, but there is a lot more to that story as well. As far as detection, even what I said before would be enough, because LIGO has this extra error associated to it. But it's a whole new story if you try to do parameter estimation, if you want to make sure that you make contact with the source of the it. The errors there have to be a lot sharper. And I don't even want to get into what LISA requirements are. LISA is going to have a signal to noise ratio that is so good that I think there is not really a good understanding on our side from numerical simulations of how to pull up the enough accuracy, even using the best techniques out there, spectral methods, etc. We're not going to have enough accuracy to give LISA as good information as it needs to be. So there's going to be some extra work that we need to do. Of course, there is has to be some understanding how to match smoothly with Poisson because what Paul defines as masses and what GR defines as masses is not really the same thing. In fact, in GR, you know you cannot define the mass if the space is dynamic. So there is going to be some compromise that we have to make and things will work, but there is some activity uh, on this front. And at the very end, you also have to give some hybrid, hybrid method to produce these waveforms that do not rely on numerical simulations because numerical simulations just give ASCII data and you want something that would be more easily encoded in the data analysis. But, and this goes back to what I said early on, there is a lot more life beyond vacuum scenarios, and that's what I'm uh, going on, uh, I'm, I'm gonna get into now. So, uh, I'm gonna switch gears, forget about black holes, uh, and just talk about neutron stars, in particular binary neutron stars, because we know they are another source, likely source of gravitational waves. 
like of today, we'll not see the merger of two neutral stars unless they happen in our, in our galaxy because of the sensitivity. Advanced LIGO, so what's going to happen five years from now, is contemplating the idea of having tunable detectors. So if you know that there's going to be some sweet piece of physics at some regime, LIGO might have the ability to uh, actually improve sensitivity in a particular part of the band if it knows that there's going to be something good to look for there. Uh, this, there are plans at the moment trying to think about where to do this, uh, so it's important to know to tell them where it's going to be uh, a worthwhile uh, uh, thing to do. The system is going to be more complex, so this is another system where you might want to study where the simplicity in the waveforms actually stand up. In fact, the answer is going to be absolutely no. There's a lot more, can, there's many more effects that can happen here that will break this very simple quasi adiabatic behavior. And I'll show you some examples as we go along. And of course, as a long shot, I would very much like to make contact with things like that we do see uh, and not yet understand well, like say gamma ray bursts or jets in some systems. And for that, you have to put everything uh, in place. So this is a collaboration done with uh, Matt Anderson, Carlos Valenzuela, Patrick Model, David Nissen, Eric Kirschman, Steve Living, and Joel Tolin. They're kind of distributed between LSU, Brigham Young University, and, and Long Island University. So the driver questions, I'm going back to that transparency I showed before. Again, you want to know what gravity waves uh, the, the theoretical expectation is so that you can compare with the data. You want to see if there is any surprise that you didn't think of at the theory level. But there is a lot more because, as I said, here there is more than one dissipated mechanism. So you like to know whether you can see in the waveforms, the, the equation of state of the star, how some um, either hydrodynamic or magnetic instabilities play a role in the system. What signatures can you use at the data at the gravitation wave level to distinguish uh, uh, these things? In fact, one of the things that LIGO has been promising is that for the first time you're going to be able to get, hopefully cleanly, the equation of state of the neutron star. And as you bring in more physics, uh, it's not clear that this is going to be something that is doable. So you have to, you'd like to understand that. And also you'd like to understand where and how you should catch these features, uh, which again ties into these tunable detectors. And if, you are, if we are going to make contact with, say, they say, these gamma ray burst models that the leading models require magnetic fields to play a major role, we'd like to know where magnetic fields can actually be amplified to the levels that these uh, theoretical expectations require, and or where the time scales involved in the systems are enough for some effects uh, called for on the astrophysics theory um, where you're going to have enough time to actually build up those, those effects uh, in the GR case. And that the answer to that, for some cases, is actually no. So let me just tell you a little bit of the setup that we have. So this is the same code we use for the binary black hole simulations, but it's uh, more complex because now you not only have to have Einstein's equations, but you also have to have MHC. These two equations, while still PDEs, they have a significant difference between the two of them. And I'm not going to say much, I'm just going to say that these guys admit shocks, these ones do not. So you have to attack them uh, in uh, quite, a bit, quite a different way. And because you have several scales in the systems, you want to put this in computers and not uh, die of old age before you get the answer, you like to have this adaptivity be a thing as well to uh, be able to describe the stars sufficiently um, and put your boundaries sufficiently far out. So we put this code, put everything together, and the first thing we do is to just slowly uh, make sure that the code works well and see how things have behave when you add more physics. So let me just show you one case. So this is a slowly differentially rotating neutron star, of which you know that if you perturb the stable, it goes back to the same star. And you know very well the frequency, the natural frequency of oscillation, say, for different perturbations. So you perturb this star radially. We know it's going to oscillate with some frequencies. These are the very good calculated frequencies done by people in Greece, Kokotas uh, <coughs> and Sturgiudas. So these are analytically known, essentially. And when you do the numerical simulations, you see the simulations, you see these oscillations, and you get the fast Fourier transform etc. to work. When you compare, and we get them uh, quite uh, accurately. 
Maybe you put a very same star and you put some magnetic fields in them, and as I'll show you later, there are some instabilities that might take place that actually will change completely this picture. In fact, it's going to start shedding off portions of the star. Let me just show you how this looks like. So we're going to start this kind of star with some poloidal magnetic fields. Because the star is differentially rotating, the fields will be dragged around at different rates. And you're going to ch completely change the distribution from a poloidal into a toroidal configuration. And in the process, you're going to generate some instabilities on the surface of the star that is actually start gonna, will start breaking apart the star. So let me just play this through. This is going to uh, be relevant to what we'll discuss next. So as we go along, these fields get strengthened because of magnetic winding. So you keep winding these magnetic fields, the strength goes up to sufficiently high values that you have some effect called magnetic buoyancy where the local pressure at some portions of the star is enough to counteract the gravitational pull to keep it together. So our next step is now to put everything together and look for a binary configuration because the binary Neutron star configuration is one of the leading candidates to explain the short gamma ray burst model. So we start with something that is the configuration that's not really physical because of the parameters chosen, but we were kind of trying to look for kind of extreme scenarios just to see what the worst behavior of the system may be. So we start with two stars. Each star has about 90% of the solar mass, it's, so it's not very realistic. We're quite low from the 1.44 uh, canonical uh, mass of the star. We start with very, very strong magnetic fields. This is our 10 to the 16 Gauss. So only magnetars get to be this strong. Uh, you, neutral stars are expected to be about 13 orders of magnitude lower than that, but again, I'm trying to look for a uh, kind of extreme scenario. We started separating our four radial uh, dis uh, distant radial, or four times the radius of the star uh, separated from each other. And we have a huge tree, so that the waveforms that you get are not contaminated from you being too close to the source. Uh, and our minimum resolution is over 400 meters. So let me, uh, Let's show this one and show you the quantity of behavior, and then we're going to get into the details. So this is the result of the dynamics of these two objects, and we're going to get um, uh, some extra details as we move along. But it shows that you get a feeling of what's going on. Again, these stars are orbiting over each, are over each other in this direction. We start this poloidal magnetic field configuration, and as they get closer, they're going to start to interact. There is going to be a very complicated dynamics, but in the end, you're going to form a massive neutron star in between quotes, uh, which will undergo a process very similar to the one we just saw for a single star. So then this here you see the magnetic field line changing their topology, if you will, and then starting to move around. And this is what uh, John Holly calls a bad comb over. Um, and what you, the color map here just telling you the, the pattern flow of the fluid. And here you are forming a bar. This bar will generate strong magnetic, uh, gravitational waves. And whether the magnetic fields are present or not will be uh, will have an impact in the type of waves you see. So let me just kind of divide the problem in some stages because one of the things I, I said that we are after is to try to see gravitational waves can actually provide further clues on these systems where we can pin down the masses, the equation of states, and the magnetic field. So we'd like to know that the combination of some effects will not just mess up things. So if changing the equation of state will impact the gravitational wave production about in the same way as, say, increasing the magnetic field, it will be hard to, for us to tell the difference between one case and another. So what I'm going to be after now is trying to see if there's going to be dominant effects through different stages. So the first one is the pre-merger. So there are two effects that can play a role here, at least nominally, for exactly the same configuration. One would be the magnetic field interaction, and the other one, the details of the equation of state that you're using. If we ignore the equation of state, something we, there is something we can say about uh, the magnetic fields. We know we can do back of the envelope calculation, look very much like post calculation, about what is going to be the effect of these uh, minor fields? Essentially, you have two dipoles, and the way we're doing things here aligned. 
So if you try to bring them to where it's like trying to bring to where to magnets, there's this repulsive force that will be used. But if you put everything together, you find out that they are not going to make a very strong effect unless the fields are about 10 to the 16, 10 to the 17 gauss. You can actually calculate what, how many extra orbits will the presence of minor fields induce in the system. And you end up with a complicated expression that looks like this. But the important thing is that in here, you have the minor fields divided by 10 to the 16 gauss. So if you have anything that is below 10 to the 16 gauss, this number is just too small. It doesn't matter. In our case, we have something that is borderline there because it's 10 to the 16 gauss where we start. And we'll see that as they make contact, this will play a, a role. But um, before that, it's, it's not. I'm going to talk about the equation of states uh, in a slightly, uh, uh, in a few transparencies because it's not, I'm going to be talking about not my, our work, but some related work. So as far as the merger is concerned, so there is qualitatively some effects that we do expect, and I have learned a lot about uh, these effects from, from this paper by Tang Shpur, which is who is in Garten, I think. Two years ago, I had no idea about magnetic fields in stars, and now I know nothing by inception of the <laughs> But So this is more or less the effects I was telling you about. We know that the fact that the star rotates differentially, okay, when you change the colloidal configuration into a toroidal configuration of magnetic field. Differential rotator, rotation is, is absolutely a mass here. If it were rotating uniformly, this effect would, wouldn't be present. And that's why you don't increase the fields as the star are not close to each other, because they're just rotating uniformly. uniformly. So whatever the field they have, they essentially just carry it for, along for the ride. We know there's going to be field amplification due to several effects. We know there is a lot of kinetic energy that can be dumped into the magnetic field energy. We know as well that as this winding take pla takes place, the field grows linearly just due to the winding in itself. And then if the star is going to collapse to a black hole, as the collapse takes place, there is compression of the field lines that also brings the strength up. The important thing is that as you build up gravity, uh, magnetic fields, these magnetic fields are able to connect inner parts of the star with outer parts of the stars, and therefore tend to also circularize for uniform mass of rotation. If that takes place in a non-trivial manner, it will change the rotation pattern, and therefore that will impact the gravitational waves. And this is something that at least qualitatively we know, we want to see if it takes place or not. I'm going to put head to head two simulations, one without magnetic fields and one with. So this is the two cases. I'm going to run this first. There is a lot of uh, details that can be obtained from here, but there is one that I care the most of. It's the maximum velocity uh, that you see in the simulation. So this number is kind of small. I, I'll just tell you what the answer is going to be. In this case, in the unmagnetized case, the maximum speed that we see is about 30% of the speed of light. Also, as these stars come together, you're going to see the central densities of the star coming together, but also will come apart if you get to the core rotating frame of the stars. You have this oscillatory motion that as you radiate the gravitational waves, they get together, uh, closer together to form a single uh, hypermassive star. So this is the star getting contact. There is some Kevin Kelvin stability going on there, uh, some funny behaviors at the outskirts. But this number never gets over 30, 32 percent. And then you have these brighter bulges um, that are coming together in a part. We'll see better this, uh, this effect in the gravitational wave signature. And as the system evolves, the star slowly start begins to collapse. And shortly after this spring, the, a black hole is formed. Let me show you the other case now. And the important thing is this number will go now to our 8 percent of the, the speed of light. So you're pushing low density stuff material at very, very high speeds outside. You see these kind of cavities that are on the side, which we'll discuss a little bit uh, further in the next transparency. And then it's hard to see here, but I have another plot that will make it more clear. This structure is a lot more spherical, like symmetric, than the one we saw before. Another important thing is this is a snapshot taken at exactly the very same time in both cases, right after, a little bit after the stars 
the outskirts of the star can touch each other. Uh, for the same density contours, these two bulges are a lot closer in the unmagnetized case than in the magnetized case. What happened here is the collision, this induced some shear energy that gets very quickly transferred into magnetic field energy. This goes, the field goes about 10 to 17 Gauss, and all of a sudden you create enough magnetic repulsion for the stars to not want to come together that quickly. And this is something that was observed before by Price and Roswell in 2006 using SPH simulations. So let me just show you some other details starting from the bottom up. This is the typical rotation, the typical picture you would get for a differentially rotating star, which tells you for this density, you don't have any density above or at this value at the center, this is the bulges that you have, so it's a lot more extreme scenario, example of our Earth being kind of planetoidal. And these kind of cavities in here are product of something that is called uh, uh, Tyler's instability or minor buoyancy. What you have done is essentially you create some vortices here. As the fluid goes around in these vortices, drags along magnetic field, and this becomes sufficiently strong that makes this little part, part to be buoyant, and then it starts shedding out of the star at that density. This kind of the standard cloth, you have a vortex at, at some given region, and then if you push it a little bit, then this there's some reconnection that takes place, and then you have quite a bit of energy here that could be released in, a, in the form of a burst. This is something that uh, Ruder and Kuzniak have studied quite a bit. It happens at about 10 to the 17 Gauss in these stars, which is interesting because that's the value at which our field saturates. So it grows from 10 to 16 to 10 to 17, and it stays there. This process takes place several times. And this is an example where we, everything in yellowish, or from kind of reddish up, from red and yellow, is telling you what local region is already able to counteract the pull of gravity. So if you see what happens a little bit after this, this little chunk is actually coming out in this direction. This chunk is going out, out in kind of diagonal upwards direction due to this uh, minor buoyancy effect. Oh, the bulk dynamics and how this uh, affects uh, the rest. Let me just point out two things. Here is the ratio of the semi-minor axis over the semi-major axis of the star. So if you had a sphere, this would be something that's identically equal to one. But what we see here is that in the magnetized case, you get a lot closer at the given time. So this, I have given that, that there is this repulsion. I offset the non-magnetized case with respect to the magnetized case so that this rise uh, coincides in both cases so that we can compare them. But it's, what it's telling you is that the magnetized case more quickly gets to a value of one, that being more spherical-like, than the non-magnetized case. So the magnetic, the magnetic field effects are really playing a role in redistributing angular momentum and letting this, this system become more asymmetric than the non-magnetized case. And that will impact the gravitation waves. Also, that effect is visible. Now here I have reversal roles. This is not this is magnetized, this is non-magnetized. This is the angular velocity versus radius in the star. And say at the very center of the star, the Unmagnetized case is giving you a velocity of 0.8, while this one is 0.4. So there's a factor of two difference between here and there. So the unmagnetized case is rotating a lot more rapidly, therefore its frequency of the gravitational wave produced in this case have a much higher frequency than this one by a factor of two. Which again, this if caught by LIGO, would be very clear distinction between one case and the other one. And this, alas, is the gravitational waves from one case on the other one. The magnetized, the non-magnetized case being this blue, so you have the, the waveform looking very much like the one I showed you for binary black hole. So this is a sinusoidal chirp that goes up. And then it starts to come down very quickly as you form this bar. And you have these oscillations that have some higher amplitude, lower amplitude, and so on, which is this bar that goes uh, this, if you go to the core rotating frame, you see this oscillation back and forth of the two bulges that have the memory of the object being produced by two stars that merge. 
For the magnetized case, you see something that is very different in this intermediate stage. This is due to this extra pressure provided by the magnetic fields that actually don't want this object to merge that quickly. So you have a higher amplitude for a longer time. And after that, then you see a very significant difference. In, and in particular, late, very late stages, this is this amplitude is much more slower than the unmagnetized case because, again, you have something that's more spherical and that is less efficient in producing gravitational waves. So, of course, this part, you can argue, is, is not realistic because you put two strong magnetic fields to begin with. Uh, so I would give that, so this is something that could be artificial, but we know there is sufficient energy, sheer energy in the system to bring these fields to this large, so it, it, it could be possible, but um, it remains to be seen after we do simulations with uh, weaker magnetic fields to begin with. But these are late stages should be there and should be detectable by LIGO if you can actually tune it, because it's already happening and the frequency is quite high, so it better be that these extra features are added in, in LIGO if we want to catch up things like this. Okay, but you said there is a problem. So if I actually want to argue, oh, the blue line is due to the stars being unmagnetized and the black line being magnetized, I have to convince you that we have to be able to pin down the equation of state first, because otherwise I wouldn't be able to tell this effect from something due to um, different uh, physics going on at the start that we didn't anticipate. So the answer to that is given by some work, very nice work, work came from the Milwaukee group and we're collaborating with them in this as well, which essentially try to parameterize our ignorance. That you grab all the equations of space that have been put out there, which are reasonable for, um, for neutral stars, hopefully, and you parameterize them in some way and you start simulations, this have been done by Masaru Shibata and Koji Oryu in Japan, which start with the very same mass, but of course have different radii because you have different equation states, and you just let it go, and try to see if there is some difference that you could catch before the merger takes place. Because as I said, after the merger, I don't think we're going to be able to tell the difference between something was caused by the fields or the equation star. And luckily for us, they do. Even before the stars touch, the our two orbits before that, you can see very clear differences in the, in the waveforms produced um, just by changing the equation of state. This is something that at first sight is kind of puzzling. Uh, people work in the, in the 80s, Thibault Amour put this out as effacement principle that said any internal structure of the compact object would show up at fifth fourth neutron in order, that is velocity to the 10 power. So if these objects are going sufficiently slow, you would expect them to actually not produce any effect. But important thing is that yes, they come out at fifth potential power, but they are multiplied by a factor that is proportional to the inverse of the compaction ratio of the object you're talking about to a large power. What I'm saying about what I'm talking about is when you have something that scales like b to the 10 times the radius of the star divided by its mass to the fifth power. This would be a number that is about 10 to the fifth. So you're multiplying a very small number times a huge number, you end up with something that actually uh, plays a role. And the reason, again, we don't see any extra features in the binary black hole case is because any internal structure induced by tidal heating or, or effects of that sort will be there, but you are multiplied by a number that is over order one to the fifth power. So that's a small number times one, it's, it doesn't play a role. So it appears as if Early on, if we follow the system for a sufficient number of cycles, we can pin down the masses and uh, the spins. As we go along, we, can, we could pin down the equation of state, and after that, we could tell something about where the magnetic fields play a role or not. Um, so again, the message is, the physics in principle could be described as a series of stages obtaining main parameters and less uh, relevant parameters we, or less dominant parameters as you go along in, in, in the gravitation wave stream. Um, we will require to fine tune the ability to fine tune the detectors. Uh, but of course, there's a lot more to be learned. I, we have only put here a very simplistic equation of state 
and just line with fields. There is a lot more physics that may play a role. Of course, if you're going to make quantum come reverse, you may have to put neutrino first. And it's important for binary neutral stars because black hole neutral stars are starting to become uh, a bit less relevant in between quotes to gamma reverse because the disks they seem to be able to form is just not too mass not massive enough. You need about one percent of the mass in the disk for these models to actually do its magic. Uh, in all simulations so far, they are way below that number. It's, they still can be saved if we consider that black holes have sufficiently large spins and sufficiently strong magnetic fields are playing a role, but there is no simulation on this problem, so it belongs to the speculative realm at this moment. So let me just kind of uh, summarize where we are. So I haven't shown you any waveforms coming from the black hole that was formed. Uh, this is something we're doing as, uh, at the moment, just resolving what happens after this uh, neutral star collapse. We do seem to see some collimation of material in the, in the z-axis, but that needs to, we, I, I, would, I would prefer to have better resolution before I can say something definite there. We definitely are looking into different initial initial data. Uh, we fields that are at most 10 to 13 Gauss to try to make a connection with possible realistic uh, scenarios. And we're using these parameterized equation of states that the Milwaukee group uh, was working with to actually see what other difference might be there. And we're looking very closely at this question where there's sufficient time for different processes to take place. So for instance, something that uh, some models at, uh, ask for is for this merge object to hang in there for above 100 milliseconds, between 100 and 200 milliseconds. So far, the evidence, evidence from the numerical simulations that is the objects do not hang that long, which then means some processes are not going to play a role, but it also means that I can do something simpler. And I get, I'll say something in this cycle. Uh, we're doing putting more infrastructure in the code, but you don't care about that. Uh, the important thing is we're actually starting to put radiation transport in the code, in collaboration with Adam Morris, Christian Allen, and uh, Stan And this brings me back to this. Because the process takes so short, we don't really need to worry at the first crack of it to do uh, this in radiation transport. Some leakage scheme that accounts for the energy that neutrinos will take away uh, might do just just well. So that's our first uh, iteration. We're going to start things in black hole neutral stars and essentially think that we're going after is trying to see if minor fields will actually lead to uh, heavier disks. Because otherwise, uh, it doesn't seem to be uh, a very likely system for making contact with gamma reverse. Um, we're adding a lot more about infrastructure as you begin to come out or with fancier or more realistic descriptions. The numerical computation goes through the roof. Of course, everyone is excited about these beta scale machines coming, but I can say with a straight face that no one really knows how to use them because of the peculiarities of the machine. Of course, we can put them there, we can use 10 to the 5 processors, but we're going to do it in a very inefficient way. And there's a lot more work to be done here. This with, in some collaboration with uh, Thomas Sterling, who is one of the co-inventors of the Google Cluster, we're actually looking at how to take advantage of this machine. Um, and I think I'm, I'm going to stop here. Thank you. Some given polytrope, or from there you do something. So there you're trying to see if 
those things will play a difference or not. The mining fields, not us, but um, Cocotas. Uh, I was looking into where the dipole distribution actually go, it stays on the crust or it goes through the cold star. And they're actually making contact with observations of neutral stars. And the claim is, I think the paper is already out or is about to be out, that if minor fields are in the crust and not through the stars, then you cannot explain some of the observations. So you do the best you can and you're slowly putting, slowly putting different physics, but ultimately everything would have to be there. Um, and simple models like this may uh, give you hints of what may be important or not. But as far as doing it realistically, we're a long way up for this hour. Well, for your magnetic field to be important, you should be really tired. Um, don't you also, besides from needing a strong field, okay, you also need a star to be fast rotating and differentially rotating. Right, so, but that and happens fast? due to the collision. So initially, but we don't care. Initially, they come with whatever they have. But I thought there was already work showing that when two neutrons converge, the spin wasn't changed very much. Right. So no, it isn't no, no, so, so it's not true merges. After you merge, you do form a strongly differentially rotating star, and that's the one that we start giving things. Yes. I see. But that time scale is not to amplify the field? That that time scale seems to be now. So if you are if you agree, so SPH simulations have this great ability to be great when they work and awful when they don't. Uh, so this, there is only one simulation that has been done, uh, this by the price Roswell group, uh, where they do seem to see, they, they grow fields from 10 to 12, 10 to 13, all the way to 10 to 17 gauss. But we are the first one, and I have to say there's a caveat here, we're the first one to do the same simulation within the context of a, some more controlled or more re reliable technique. We ask, very shortly after our paper, the, the Illinois group put a paper treating the same system, and they don't see such a large amplification. But I should say that we didn't see it either when we used their resolution. Their resolution is too slow for our taste. In fact, that's a plot. I think this is the plot I showed last year in August, where the light ring uh, is one case, and well, no, here you have for the magnet, this is the magnetized case. And you see nothing interesting here going, going on. And this is the same resolution that the, the Illinois group used. In our, afterwards, we increased the resolution by a factor of four. And even at a factor of two, we've started seeing this effect. So I think they are under resolved. This, this minor fields are now seeing that you have to resolve much more scale for actually treating them accurately. So, so far, I would say the price for all the also result in, argues for you being able to go three, four hours among you very easily in a very short amount of time. And now our results are consistent with that, but we start with a lot stronger among your fields to begin with. So maybe in a few months I'll be able to tell you where we, are, we still see the same thing. And uh, my impression is actually a little bit the same as, as Ray's. Um, I mean, so I, but I, maybe I could reverse it. I mean, how many bits of the information do you think you can ever get out of all of these these Oscillation light because most of it's just orbital momentum, so it's not so interesting. I mean, it's orbital motion, it's not so interesting. Indeed, there are a lot of complications, especially rigid crust and tides and everything change. Well, in this part, I mean, yeah. the burden is on the theory side and the, on, and the data analysis side. If I take the black line, which is yeah. the, no, the blue line, which is the template I would get without using my fields, and do the match with the black line, I get zero. So I wouldn't see a thing. But if I actually have both of them and I do the match with the signal, then this one would tell me, will give me a high signal to noise, but well, the other one will give you yes, zero. Yes, but of course there will be uh, a rather large number of possibilities. Absolutely, right. So uh, only after you start putting the different effects and then you start looking at what the signals are, uh, then of course in the worst case scenario, you're going to be able to say, okay, this system is certainly not this uh, within these parameters, but it might be a combination of water. I'm actually more worried about things before we even reach the merger. I mean, it doesn't matter whether the star has a crust, which is solid okay. and has very different diagonal effects. Right, so early on, yeah. we cannot tell anything. We just can say these are the mass and these are the speed. So this is, you see, one, even with this very strong artificially, artificially strong minor fields, there's no difference here. So 
we cannot see anything. We cannot see the structure, the inner structure is covered, we cannot see the magnetic fields. After that, when they get to this point, this difference in the question of state play a big role when the magnetic fields are still not. But you're right, I mean, we have to find out which effects actually play a, a role in here. And the end, there is going to be some deterrence. It's already the binary black hole case where there is nothing but G gravity playing a role. We know there are deterrence. Well, yeah, it, well, it depends on how quickly you are. If you're well, you you grown sufficiently it. quickly, where you still re, uh, retain some of the apoidal structure about the initial high densities of each individual object, they'll feel some repulsion. If not, then this is completely, it's completely artificial, and you're just going to see them this later, latter part. But if this thing is hanging for 50, 70 milliseconds, you have enough time to start to this really is quite a bit longer momentum, and these differences will be there. Uh, if these are tuning transfers, the frequencies of this final structure is right right in basically in the middle of the LIGO thing? No, 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 that's the problem with these stars, is that these frequencies are about between a kilohertz and three kilohertz. So, no, this is, it, it's something for advanced LIGO, or for us being lucky, it's happening around us. If you have, um, even if your two neutron stars are initially non-spinning, but you're assuming they have large magnetic fields, uh, if they're, if the magnetic fields are not aligned with the overlying momentum, you'll, you'll get some, presumably some magnetic, purely magnetic precession. Yeah, but I think that one tends would, to be K, right? Because these are, you have them, I mean, this, the orbit would take a long time to bring them together. Right. So this, one of the things that magnetic fields would do is bring the stars to uniform rotation. So you'd expect that to take place before they get together. The, the, the stars are uniform, by uniform rotation you mean that the, I mean rotation of the stars, or I'm not talking about rotation of the stars. Oh, what I'm talking about, I mean, imagine the, the neutron stars are initially not rotating, but they have a large magnetic dipole, and, then, and, then, and those magnetic dipoles are not aligned with the orbital angular momentum of the system. Right. Then won't you get some purely magnetically induced precession? Uh, the magnitude of it may be small, I haven't run right, that. Right, good question. It's exact, exactly the same as, that would be the, the analog to the binary black hole case, and the answer right. is, no, they just come along for the ride, so the spin-spin effect Well, you spin. definitely get orbital precession in the black hole case if you're spinning black hole. Yes, you do, but there is a, in what people are calling precession, there's, there's a mixture of two things. There is some gauge effects and some real effects. So when I'm saying, as they come together, they come along for the ride till they are sufficiently close. And yes, when they become sufficiently close that they start making effect, we're going to have to disentangle that from what my claim of perhaps us being able to pin down the equation of state before they, they start merge. But it, well, we'll have to see. It, whatever the equation of state is, it still it wouldn't be hard to imagine what leads precession if they're non spinning. Yeah, no, but right, but they've got to. Yeah, surface fields, Mike, it's going to be insignificant. You think the amount of precession will be? Absolutely. Depends, I guess you're saying, over the time scales for. Even compared to the in spiral time scale, which is usually longer than the By the time, time that scale. you're close enough to the dipole fields to matter, you're going to be. Uh, they are small. Because I mean, remember, these guys. They were 17 or 10 to 18 originally. They, uh, right. So uh, these guys would be of the order of three fourths magnitude smaller than what I showed before. And they, they, the interaction is pretty much like the spin speed interaction, but they have a much more magnitude. Much smaller magnitude. But traditionally, the precession time scale is shorter than the in spiral time scale. Right? Like in the, in the black hole case, the, in the black radiation, hole case. radiation reaction falls up slower, and falls up faster. Yeah. With R then. So even though it's really long time scale, the radiation reaction time scale is really, really long. Yeah. So. I, I mean, after all the numbers, I was just curious. I mean, yeah, I haven't done that. Okay. Move on. Okay. The, the, the one last thing. So you're talking about magnetic fields and how they affect things by creating magnetic pressure and whatnot. But of course, if you have very strong magnetic fields, they also change the equation of state. Yes. But typically, they make things actually stiffer, which goes in the same direction as having just magnetic pressure. So I'm curious if you guys are including that or uh, no, no. This this okay. simulation took two months. Yeah. And mm -hmm. yeah. So only when we start, I, if we actually are able to to work with this new machine sufficiently, we're only going to be able to just scratch the surface of a little bit of cor corner in the primary space.
hopefully we'll be able to learn some generic features out of it, but I don't know, at the moment, that's what you can do. All right, I think we've got to stop.